Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for being with us today. Um, my name is Jen Andrews, and I'm a project director at the University of New Hampshire Sustainability Institute, um, where I've been for the last four and a half years. And one of the projects I direct is the project around SIGNOP, which is the culmination of more than 15 years of working with many of you and many other campuses on tools for campus carbon accounting, and now um, over time accounting for um, other indicators as well, including nitrogen. Um, so we're really excited to be with you today um, to talk through um, one of the changes um, that uh, folks have experienced as they've begun using SIMAP um, and sort of transitioned from other tools, including the Campus Carbon Calculator or Carbon Map. And so our focus for today is going to be talking about accounting for renewables um, and specifically about changes that, for reasons we'll talk about uh, in a couple minutes, affect um, how you enter scope one inputs, how you enter scope in, scope two inputs, um, and how you um, sort of look at and use the results and reporting functions. Um, so we, we'll be looking specifically at those, at those kind of questions or aspects of the tool today. Um, our agenda will be as follows. We're going to take a couple minutes to talk about the changes in methodology and the rationale behind them and sort of what they mean um, conceptually and how they work conceptually. And then we'll look specifically at what that means for users of SIMAP as you enter your data, um, as you look at your results and do your reporting. And then that should leave us uh, a good chunk of time for questions and discussion. Um, and we do want to hear from you about your, your questions and comments. Um, also, um, don't feel compelled to wait until the end um, to share those questions. What we're going to do is have, um, have that facilitated just to make it a little bit easier. And so um, if you, if and as you um, have questions or comments, please feel free to use the chat box to enter them. And um, when we get done with the formal presentation, um, we'll uh, read through those and, and work through those with you all. So um, please be, feel free to be entering those as we go along. <clears throat> okay, so uh, in the interest of leaving lots of time for questions and discussion, let's dive in here to the content. So we want to start with talking about uh, scope two reporting and, um, and how it has worked historically, because as I said, there are changes to the methodology and there are reasons for changing that methodology. So um, just as a refresher for everyone, um, a little carbon accounting 101, the way that the scope two emissions, and specifically we're talking about um, scope two emissions from electricity, purchased electricity, have been accounted for. It's been very similar to the way all of the calculations are done in this tool or any other tool. Um, you have activity data, which is your, your data around how much electricity you're purchasing. Um, so that's your number of kilowatt hours generally. Um, and then you multiply that by an emissions factor. Um, and there are various types of emissions factors that um, have been used historically. And I'll, I'll, there's a couple of examples here, which we'll talk through in a minute. But it's basically your activity data, your purchases, times your emissions factor, equal your greenhouse gas emissions, your CO2 or CH4 or N2O. And obviously, there's some weighting that gets done to wrap those all into one number. And then you add those scope two emissions to your scope one and scope three emissions. And that gave you your gross emissions, your gross metric tons of carbon dioxide. And then you would subtract any um, renewable energy certificates, any RECs that you purchased, or you'd add any RECs that you sold, and you'd subtract any offsets, and that would get you your net emissions. That's how we have always done it. Um, and of course, that um, had some issues. Um, one issue being it treated RECs as offsets, um, as though they were equal or similar, or, um, well, not similar, as though they were 
um, identical um, from an accounting perspective, and, and they're not. Um, they're, they're pretty different vehicles, actually. So that was one issue. And then the other issue, and the big one, is that these emissions factors um, here, the, the sort of shapes that you see, the gut initials, um, there were any number of sources that people could use for those. And depending on what source you used, you'd have a different number, which would give you different results. So let's say, for example, that you had a campus that had, you know, uh, a million kilowatt hours a year. And let's say, for sake of argument, that that same campus um, also bought 500 megawatts of, of RECs, 500 RECs every year. So half of its utility consumption. And again, just sort of running through for sake of argument, let's say that same campus had calculated its scope one GHGs at 10,000 metric tons and its scope three greenhouse gases as 5,000 metric tons. If that campus used the grid, um, the e-grid factor, the default factor, which is the factor that um, is gen generally offered as a default from um, the campus carbon calculator or carbon map and also other kind of reporting um, tools and platforms like carbon disclosure project or climate registry, they would often use egrids as um, defaults. And the egrid factor is a measured factor which looks at the entire grid region um, from which you're purchasing electricity and it looks at how much greenhouse gas pollution came from that region and how many um, how much electricity was generated in that region and so it gives you an observed amount of greenhouse gas per kilowatt hour essentially and so if you use that default factor that campus that sample campus might get a, a scope two total of 4,000 metric tons a gross total for all three scopes of 19,000 metric tons and then once the reps were subtracted a net total of 17,000 metric tons but you could have the exact same inputs and if that campus decided to instead use an emissions factor that was given to them by their supplier, let's say they um, worked with a municipal utility, and the municipal utility offered um, emissions factors uh, which looked at the emissions impact that they uh, experienced in their generation. If that same campus with the same inputs used that supplier specific factor, and let's say for the sake of argument, it's um, three. Uh, 0 0.003 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, then, then that same campus with those same inputs would have maybe 3,000 um, tons of scope two emissions and 18,000 gross and 16,500 net. Um, that same campus could have another um, emissions factor, not from their supplier, not from eGrid, but maybe from the state or some other reporting platform they were using. Or very often, what would happen is a campus would get the fuel mix from their utility um, and then calculate emissions factors based on that utility mix, which would give them still other totals. So the issue that we were have had all along in doing our greenhouse gas reporting for scope two emissions, electric emissions, is that you could have these same inputs and have completely different outputs, but we didn't have a way of communicating what was driving those different outputs or what sort of, um, uh, what emissions factors we were using. And so, um, in 2015, the Greenhouse Gas Protocol convened working groups to develop updated, updated guidance around scope two reporting um, in order to try to provide more transparency, more comparability, um, methods that allowed for a more clear reflection of the impact of individual purchasing decisions, and, and methods that allowed for more clarity around what your actual what your results were saying, what those, what those scope two numbers meant. Um, and just as a reminder, the Greenhouse Gas Protocol is the um, multi-sector, um, international, non-governmental body uh, that has worked to develop carbon accounting guidance globally over the last two decades to support processes like the, the Paris Agreement um, to support carbon accounting and reporting by nation states. And then um, that guidance that they put out has been um, has been uh, used to develop programs for business reporting and entity level reporting. It's taking that sort of national level reporting and making it translatable to individual entities. And so um, we care about what the Greenhouse Gas Protocol says because they are 
the arbiter of international carbon accounting standards. So this isn't a UNH thing, it's not a second nature thing, it's an international thing, and, and our goal has always been to try to develop tools and reporting methodologies that are in line with sort of global standards. And so this new guidance came out about um, a little over, a little over a year ago, maybe two years ago now. Um, and what it says is that, in fact, um, entities should calculate their scope to emissions in two different and, and specific ways um, and be able to report both of those totals and be able to say which of which method was used in in getting to both of those totals. So there's a market-based method and a location-based method and the idea is that um, any entity that's 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 calculating um, should be able to um, calculate both of those um, methods. So we'll look at those methods in a minute. But the idea broadly is that um, the market-based method is trying to capture the impact of individual decisions um, and individual participation in, in markets and programs. So um, for entities that are, are, are using their, their money and their time and their influence to um, move markets and bring change, that, that they're seeing that um, you know, rewarded and incentivized and reflected as they're doing reporting about their impact. Um, and the location-based method is meant to um, give a, an accurate reflection of what is the actual just basic impact of pulling electricity off of um, the grid depending on where you are because the reality of course is that the grid regions um, do react to market programs and um, policies but they react slowly and um, and they're not sort of segmented along the same lines as some of our um, you know regulatory bodies or um, state that the, the policy gets made at um, with different sort of geographic boundaries perhaps than the grid has and so um, the, there is a sort of real impact from drawing power off of one grid versus another and and that that impact might not be reflected in emissions factors that are um, designed to communicate the the value of um, localized leadership and so they're meant to communicate two different things, the market-based and location-based methods. And they work in two different ways. So the location-based method is based, as I said, on location. It's, it's meant to show the impact of, of using electricity in a particular grid region. And so that calculation is done purely by taking your um, consumption and multiplying it by a location-based factor, an e-grid factor here in the US, and that gets you your totals in the same way it did before. You don't subtract um, anything for renewable energy credits. That's not reflected in the location-based method. It's purely looking at what is the impact of a kilowatt hour pulled off of this, this grid in this location. Um, so, so it is the location-based method specifies which emissions factor and it does not um, reflect the impact of um, individual renewable energy contracts or um, relationships or purchases. The market-based method is designed to reflect the impact of those, um, but it, it changes a couple of things. So the first thing it does is it takes the renewable energy credits calculation and it moves it um, up, uh, up sooner in the process. So rather than um, subtracting the impact of RACs after you've calculated your gross emissions, what it does is it says, um, figure out what your consumption is and then adjust it based on whatever renewable energy purchase or sales you might have made. And then take that adjusted total, that adjusted consumption total, and multiply it by an emissions factor. And the market-based method says, if you have a supplier-specific emissions factor, you may and you should use it um, because that's also um, reflective of the market and market conditions. If you don't have that, then you should still use the grid factor or e grid. And so you multiply that adjusted consumption by your supplier specific, if you have it, or e grid factor if you don't, and you get your total scope two and you add that for your gross, and then you know it works as before. So those are the two methods, conceptually speaking. 
And what it comes down to is that the math ends up being the same as it was before, the 19,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide for that sample campus with the 1 million kilowatt hours. And um, that would have been what it was without what, what that sample campus had without the renewable energy credits. So that would be the location-based total. Um, and then the market-based total is you'd have 16,500, which is exactly how the math would have worked out before. So the math isn't actually um, changing necessarily. It's the specificity, it's, it's, it's what you're sort of communicating about what emissions factor is being used, and it's also the degree to which RECs are or are not being incorporated. So that's the rationale um, behind the change. Now I wanna, um, and I'm happy to answer, as I said, questions about it. Um, in fact, maybe it would make sense to just stop and see if there are any burning questions about that um, right now. I'm just gonna check the chat here and see. Um, doesn't look like it. Okay. Well, if anyone does have questions moving forward, feel free to, um, to register them using the chat function. Um, in the meantime, I'm gonna keep going and we're gonna talk now about what steps you need to take as you're using SIMAP to ensure that SIMAP is helping you do this accurate accounting. Um, so there are five essentially basic steps um, that you need to do and we're gonna walk through each of them, um, but this is the sort of complete list. Um, there may be some steps for looking at your scope one stationary inputs, depending on what your power um, kind of profile is. Um, there will be steps for your scope two utility consumption inputs. And if you participate in renewable energy markets or make renewable energy pur purchases or your um, um, have supplier specific emissions factors, which is also a, a sort of way of communicating you know, market activity, um, you're gonna enter it in here. Um, and, and, and that's gonna be part of step four as well. And then there's a sort of data management step on the back end we'll talk about in a moment as well. Um, okay, so we're gonna just work through this list here. And so we're gonna start with scope one and stationary, um, scope on stationary input. So this applies if you have any on-site self-generation, um, you know, solar or wind or whatever that you own or that you lease, um, or off-site self-generation that you own or lease. Um, likewise, if you have an on-site PPA, even, you know, like a partnership with a third party where you don't own or lease it, but it's on-site, there is a data input um, element in scope one. And so if you, any of those situations apply to you, when you go under data entry, um, you're gonna wanna report them in under scope one. So you'll um, select your, you go to um, data entry, you pick um, stationary fuels from the pick list on the left-hand side, and you pick enter data, and it's gonna pull up a, a data entry form. And um, so you'll see that the first thing on the form will be a question about the source, um, so, for example, you could pick, you know, on-campus stationary wind or on-campus stationary solar. And then it's going to ask you, and this is really important from the perspective of getting the accounting right, whether or not you um, own the RECs associated with this power generation. Now, this question is asking you, do you, as part of this contract or arrangement um, or um, uh, situation, do you have the right to make the decision about what happens with the RECs. So if you, um, if this is a scope one source, if it's something that you own um, or lease and operate and you're using the power and there's nobody else really involved in this arrangement, then you are gonna check that box. You own those RECs. Um, it's renewable energy that's servicing your campus directly. You're gonna check it. Um, okay, I just got a uh, text that the slides are not advancing. Let me just see if that helped. Um, you should be seeing a slide that just says add stationary fuels data. Yulia, you can unmute yourself if you want. Is that not what you're seeing? 
No, we're still on the steps to ensure accurate accounting. The, mm -hmm. the slide with all the list. Okay. Ah, here we go. Okay. Thank you. Then, no, thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. Um, so basically, as I said, you're going to go to, oh, okay, let's try it again. There we go. So on the data entry form under stationary fuels data, if under source, you choose a source that is a renewable source, if you choose wind or solar, biogas, you will see this checkbox um, pop up that says, my campus owns the recs associated with this power generation. So if you, um, if you retain or retire those recs, if that's like, again, a self-generation, you want to check it. Um, or if it's, um, you know, a, uh, this, this question isn't asking, um, this question is just asking about the rights to the recs. So for example, if you have an installation and you sell the recs, ultimately, you should still check the box that says you own the rights to them. Um, because what it's asking me is, do you own the right to make the decision about what happens to this? Do you own the right to retire it or sell it? Whatever you want to do. Um, so again, if it's a scope one source, if it's something that you own or lease, you're going to always check this box, even if um, for some period of time you're selling the recs. If it's an on-site power purchase agreement, um, we still want you to enter the data about any on-site power purchase agreements where you're purchasing the, um, the power from an on-site installation. But it may very well be the case that as part of that um, power purchase agreement, your agreement with the third party you know, partner or provider is that they keep the rights to those recs and you're buying the power from them. So if that's the case, then you make sure this box stays unchecked because that impacts the accounting um, for the recs. It essentially means that the power that you're getting from this source then gets treated as regular fossil fuel power rather than renewable power. If you check this box, it's um, going to um, treat the recs as though you own the rights to make decisions about them. So that's the first thing to be aware of. Once you've entered any on-campus um, renewables, or as I said, um, scope one renewables where you own or operate it and it's off-campus, um, once you've entered those here, then that's that first step completed. So then the next step is to go on to um, the scope two data entry sheet and to focus on utility consumption. And at that step, you're going to want to document any or all power that you purchase from any of these sources. Um, in terms of renewables, this will include any offsite, either physical or virtual power purchase agreements. It will include any utility green pricing programs, any direct, you know, green tariff programs, any um, community solar or community aggregation. Um, and obviously under utility consumption, you're also including any non-renewable power. So the scope to utility consumption um, data input is asking, it is literally asking, tell us all about any electricity that you purchase um, from anyone anywhere. Um, and so that's going to be under the data entry tab, under scope two on the left hand menu bar, and under source, you're going to choose electricity, steam or chilled water, electricity, you're going to put in your date range um, and enter the quantities. So it's, that should be very straightforward, but again, it's all power that comes from off campus or that's purchased from an outside entity. Um, and it may be that you want to enter that, like just could do the mat, like combine it all and enter it as one line item, or it might be that you want to enter them as separate line items. So, um, you know, in this example here, this is what you see, um, when you go to the data entry tab and click on the utility consumption um, menu, this is what you're gonna see if you have any data entered. It shows you what your data points are. So you can see in this example for 2017, all electricity was just entered as one line item. Um, and for 2016, there are two line items, one for an offsite PPA where they're purchasing 40 megawatt hours and another 30 megawatt hours from their, or, um, utility for that same year. So you can do it either way, it doesn't matter, but you need to make sure all of your purchased electricity for the year is entered here. Okay, so that's step two, straightforward. 
we're on to, I think this is probably the part that's been um, confusing people the most, um, the third step, which is also documenting renewable energy under the second link here under the scope to menu heading on the left hand menu under data entry. Um, so if you have purchases or sales of any renewable energy, you should have probably already entered that energy um, either uh, under the utility consumption, which we just looked at, or if it's sales, it means you're generating it. Um, so you should have entered that generation under scope one. So anything you enter, well, almost everything you enter on the scope two renewable energy form is going to be duplicative of something that you entered under utility consumption or something that you entered under scope one. But what this does is this allows us to sort of know what adjustments we need to make um, in your consumption data in order to make sure that the multiplication happens correctly. So, for example, if you have at the, that offsite PPA, we were just looking at the utility consumption data entry for um, once you enter it as, as, once you enter your consumption under utility consumption, you also go to the renewable energy tab, you enter it as, let's say, you know, this is a solar PPA, so let's say you enter it as renewable energy purchase, solar, you put the date in, and you put the quantity in, and then you can specify what type it is. So, you know, this is a power purchase agreement in this example. So you enter that there. Um, and again, this is what you see when you first click on this tab. Once you've got data entered, it will show you what you've entered. So here's that example of that, of that being entered. Um, the other thing, the only thing you would enter on this tab that you won't also enter either under utility consumption or scope one, cons uh, scope one generation is if you purchased unbundled renewable energy credits because um, if they're unbundled renewable energy credits, it's um, you're not. That's different than buying the power. The power purchase is what you are recording under utility consumption. But if you purchase unbundled recs, um, you're going to want to enter them under renewable energy data, as well as entering the renewable attributes of any renewable power that you um, purchased that you recorded under utility consumption. So hopefully that's clear, but of course, again, when we get to the end, happy to take any questions about that. Um, so once you've done that, once you've um, done those three bits of data entry, this, um, the on-campus, uh, the on-campus or off-site self-generation, any PPAs, any um, purchasing, green energy purchasing from direct or retail providers, any fossil fuel purchasing from your utility. And then once you've, again, gone in and documented all of the renewable energy under the scope two renewable tab, then you, um, if you have one, the last thing you need to do in order to have an accurate um, market-based total is to enter your supplier specific emissions factor. Now, it's still relatively rare um, to have a supplier specific emissions factor. Um, this is not asking for the fuel mix. This is asking for a factor, um, a, a measured factor from a utility, and there's criteria around that. They want it to be um, ideally something that is, you know, pub that is publicly available. Um, they want it to make sure that it includes all of the power that the utility provides to its customers, not just the power that the utility generates, because they're not necessarily the same thing. Um, there, there's a number of criteria um, for these emissions factors. But, you know, for example, like that municipal utility example um, that I offered before, I was just working with a campus in California who has a um, gets their power from a municipal utility, and that municipal utility does provide emissions factors specifically. So if you have those, you want to go ahead and enter them. Um, and you can enter them by clicking on the data entry tab at the top, and then on the left-hand menu, all the way down at the bottom, there will be um, a heading that says utility emissions factors. And it will pull up a screen that looks like this, um, that looks like the, the, the inputs will look at the um, 
It will ask you for the, the source. It will ask you for the emission types of CO2, CH4, N2O. And then once you've specified that, it will pull up a table. So it will show you what it's using now. The default is the E-grid. Um, and you can enter a custom fuel mix here. But again, this is only for supplier specific. Um, and that is it in terms of data entry in SIMAP to make sure that your accounting is accurate. There's one more step to make sure that you're reporting, um, that, the, 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 that you're sort of getting, that you're looking at the results that you want to look at. Um, I should say first that um, the default and SIMAP to this point has been to use market-based calculations. Um, with the idea being that market-based calculations are the one that Second Nature is most interested in. Those are the ones that um, you're gonna want to enter into the Second Nature reporting platform. Those are the ones, as I said, that give people sort of credit and that reflect the degree to which they are um, entering into all these different sort of renewable energy arrangements. Um, and so market-based, the, the results, if you go right now and look at your results, um, the calculation that is being done is the market-based calculation. Um, however, what you will see, um, a, a new feature that you will see um, this week is, um, you'll find it on the data management tab, and it's a, page that allows you to specify your calculation sources and methods. So um, the first thing you want to do is make sure that your eGrid regions are accurate um, and you can click on the map if you need to to make sure um, that the region that is on the pick list represents your region. Um, these eGrid um, pick lists are currently under the account institution tab and they're, um, when we roll out this new feature um, later this week it will be um, they'll be in the data management tab. So that's the first thing you wanna do is make sure that your eGRID region is accurate. And then down here under scope two method, you'll see that you have a choice between market-based or location-based. Um, and so you wanna select the methodology for which you want to view the results. And as I said, for second nature, um, for purposes of reporting, you're gonna to want to select market-based because those are the results that um, they are collecting in, in the reporting platform for the climate commitment, for, for climate and carbon commitment signatories. So that's it. Um, you've entered your data, you've gone to data management and made those um, selections, and then you can view your results. If you click on the results page, it will ask you to make a couple of choices around what you want to view um, and then depending on what you select so in this case you know we selected carbon and nitrogen we asked for the total footprint and we asked for 2010 to 2016 and so we'll give you graphs for those things and then a table as well and so the scope two total that you see under results is going to reflect whatever calculation well right now it reflects the market-based method um, and um, once this data management feature is in place um, very shortly, whatever is reflected is whatever you select. Market-based will remain the default selection, so if you don't go in and change it, it's what you see under results is going to show you the market-based scope two total. Um, and the same is true for the um, report. Um, that is generated in SIMAP to be shared with the, on the annual progress evaluation form um, on Second Nature's reporting platform. So um, those of you that are tier one subscribers are, are probably already, um, are probably already familiar with this report, um, which shows you the, the totals, uh, the, the sort of fields that get populated. Um, and again, the scope two totals are gonna reflect whatever calculation method you've selected. Right now they select, they reflect market-based, but in the future you're gonna just wanna, before you um, enter any of these totals into the reporting platform or, um, or have them sort of pulled over automatically using the API, you wanna just make sure you've selected the market-based um, accounting methodology. And then once you've 
confirm that, you can again go to data management, mark that particular year as complete, and then you can go into the reporting platform and use the API to bring the data over if you're a tier one subscriber. And that's the overview. Just wanted to remind people that there um, are um, tools and guidance. There's a user's guide on the resources page. We'll have this video and we'll have a couple of animations, like a couple of little tutorials on this resource page as well to walk people through um, for particular sort of situations. Um, just a reminder of what you need to enter and where. Um, but um, when in doubt, please don't hesitate to use the tools here on the resources page. And that is what I have to share with you. And um, I imagine, and I hope, we have some questions. Um, let's see here. I see some things in the chat box that look like they may, I don't know who all they went to. Yulia, do you have questions that you would like to run through? Um, I have one question from Chris Wojcik. Does the data management page have the option to select location-based approach right now? Um, it does not, right? The second we were hoping to have that ready for um, for this afternoon, but um, and and we have it um, sort of all programmed into our site. But we just want to um, do a couple more checks and make sure that the calculations are all sort of perfectly in line before we make it live. So I would expect that that would be um, live by. Um, you know, tomorrow or Wednesday, Wednesday at the latest. So, yeah. Um, Anybody else? So I see some that have been, it looks like they were submitted um, privately, so maybe they just didn't go to everybody. Um, so... I have one more, Jen. Sure. Yeah. Uh, can you please re-explain why the offsite PPA has to be reported in the utility consumption data form as well? I understand why it goes in the renewable energy, but I'm confused why it gets duplicated in the utility consumption form. Right. So um, it gets back to this question of um, how the, it's partly how SIMAP is set up, but it's partly also the, um, the calculation methodology. So what we're trying to get at in SIMAP is um, this, we're, we're trying to make sure that we have all the variables we need to do the calculation. So um, we, the utility consumption page is literally where we collect information about what the sort of, what your overall utility consumption yeah, so if you're, um, if you have an offsite PPA, that is power that you are provide that you are buying. Um, and then the renewable energy form, we ask you to, what the renewable energy form is collecting is information about like the, the green attributes of the power. So this sort of gets back to this notion of um, the whole green energy market or green energy um, yeah, markets, I guess, or the idea of renewable energy credits, they, um, they work by sort of thinking about the power, the actual electrons as one commodity and the, and the greenness of the power or the renewable nature of the generation as a separate commodity. And so you can buy just electrons, you can buy just the greenness, as it were, or you can buy green electrons. Um, and we do not make the assumption um, if, if you, um, how to put it, um, anyway, since those, since, but since the electrons and the, and the renewable nature of the generation are divided in terms of markets, um, we have them divided in SIMAP so that we're, we know we're not accidentally conflating the two ever. So that's why we're asking you to enter your utility consumption in one place and then separately tell us, essentially we're asking you to tell us, okay, so now how much or, or which parts of that utility consumption were renewable? Um, but first we need to know what's your overall consumption. I, I hope that helped. <laughs> if not, I'm happy to have an offline um, conversation. Um, about it. So 
then the, it looked like a follow-up question was, if we're just buying the greenness of the electrons and not the electrons themselves, in other words, if you're buying unbundled racks, do you still need to enter the data and utility consumption? And the answer is no. The utility consumption is literally just about the power. The renewable energy section is just about the, um, is just about the, uh, the greenness of the electrons. So again, under utility consumption, you're documenting any or all electrons from any of these sources. Oops, sorry, accidentally went off that slide. And then in the renewable energy section, you're documenting any renewable, the, the greenness of electrons. And so again, there may very well be duplication there, but the utility consumption is literally just about the power and the renewable energy uh, section is, is just about the greenness. So, you know, the reverse example of that is UNH as an example. We have a, um, a renewable, we have a cogeneration plant and it's partially fueled by landfill gas. So we use the power from the landfill gas, but we sell um, renewable energy credits from it as well. So, um, you know, it's possible to have an arrangement where you're using, it, it, it's, it's frequently possible to have the sort of power piece different than the renewable piece and to have different permutations of that. And that's why they're divided out in SIMAP and that's why we're asking you to enter the data potentially twice so that we're just really clear on who owns the greenness, quote unquote, who's using the electrons. Um, and, and we're not necessarily conflating the one with the other. We have one tactical question. Sure. If we switch from e-grid to market for basing our scope to emissions, how will this impact past output numbers? In particular, how will we be able to compare the past e-grid output numbers with the new market numbers? So, okay, so two things about that. Um, one is, the guidance is not that you switch from one to the other per se. I mean, the guidance is you need to know both totals. Um, so the good thing about SIMAP and the way that we are have it, that the reason for sort of implementing those radio buttons on the data management page is so that you can have the same inputs in there and very quickly and easily switch back and forth. Okay, here's the location-based results, here's the market-based results. Um, now, in terms of what are you using to set goals and, you know, to evaluate your baseline, it makes sense, I think, in a voluntary program, given where the markets are right now, to use market-based um, calculation and reporting to, to figure out, to, to report both your baseline and your current year because this market base is gonna allow, is gonna reflect um, participation over time. And right now we're also limited in the ways in which we can, um, you know, influence our scope to emissions that, that we need to be able to reflect that. Um, but what that means is that um, you may need to go back and um, re, um, revise your, baseline calculation. Now, that said, um, market-based, your market-based calculation, um, let me actually go back to that graphic for a second. Um, if you are, or if in your baseline year, for example, you were not using, you were not purchasing RECs of any kind or selling RECs of any kind, um, and you didn't have a supplier-specific emissions factor, what that would, oh geez, sorry, I have to stop clicking on the screen. Um, what that would mean would be that essentially your market-based total would come out to be the same as a location-based total because the RECs would be a completely moot point. Oh, Jennifer. Um, so they wouldn't factor into it. And as you see, the market-based method says, use a supplier-specific emissions factor if you have one. If you don't, use eGrid. So the effect of the market-based calculation for someone that is not buying RECs in any given year and does not have a supplier-specific emissions factor is that it is exactly the same calculation as the location-based method. Um, so your baseline year, if you weren't buying RECs, 
it might actually look exactly the same as using egrid as a base. You might not actually have to revise your, your baseline here because the math might be the same. Um, if you did have, if you were buying Rex in your baseline year, or you did have a supplier specific emissions factor, then you would want to revise your baseline totals um, using that data, using the market-based method, and then you know, report accordingly moving forward. Um, but the idea behind the location base, because someone said, well, why would you ever use the location base? The idea behind the location base was that, um, um, how to put it, the location base is the, honestly, the most accurate reflection of just like the real world snapshot and time impact of using power in a grid region. So there is an argument to be, you could make an argument that in some ways that's more accurate in terms of a snapshot in time of your, of your impact than the market-based method because you know, all the, all the recs and um, all the sort of voluntary things that we are doing are reflected in those egrid numbers. Like those egrid numbers already include all that renewable generation. And so in some ways, part of the reason for doing this was because there was like a double counting going on. Um, but the actual impact of pulling a, an electron off of the grid region is reflected in that egrid number. So you know, sort of doesn't give credit per se, but it does reflect a reality. And that's the idea or the reason behind the notion of, okay, we should know what our location based numbers are. Um, we, we have a quick question about being able to see these calculations side by side. Right, so one of the things we're, we're working on is especially for the second, for the report um, for the annual progress evaluation for second nature is having a, um, an ability to, to do that, to say, here's your market-based total, here's your location-based total. The reason that they're not wrapped into, like, we don't have them both on the results form is that the results um, tab is, you know, it, it, it's, it's additive. Actually, here, let me go back to this. It's because in or, you want sort of one total for your, um, your gross and your net. And obviously if you have two different versions of your scope two total, then um, you, you're not gonna add them both together and include them. So it's like, okay, we need one scope two number in order to get to this one gross and one net number. Uh, so that's why they haven't, we haven't done that so far. But yes, we, will, we are definitely working on and thinking about how to make it easy to see both totals, um, understanding that uh, in order to sort of say, here's our baseline and here's our goal, you're ultimately going to need to pick one <laughs> to use for that. Um, so, yeah. Um, what else? Uh, we have a quick question about the version of the eGrid that um, SIMAP uses currently. Um, so, we... Uh, boy, I wish I had um, screenshots of the versioning here for you. Um, so the default is is that we're using the most recent um, eGrid totals, um, which I think came out last spring or last fall now and goes through 2014, I want to say. Um, but um, one thing to note is that... Um, the data management tab also um, is going to have a, a pick list that allows you to pick which version of emissions factor. So the default is always going to be the most, um, you know, updated, up-to-date data that we have for emissions factors. But if you wanted to be able to go back and say, oh, I wanna, look, I wanna rerun my numbers looking at the emissions factors from 2016, for example, um, we want you to be able to do that just to sort of have that historical, that ability to do those historical comparisons um, and, you know, make sure that things get imported correctly or transferred incorrectly. Um, so you'll have the ability to sort of look at what version of the emission factors are being used on that data management tab. Um, but in the, the e-grade question, the answer is it's the most recent version.
Anything else? Um, we have one more question from Chris. Based on my reading of the WRI scope to guidance, the corporate standard requires that we report both. Yeah, no, I get. I mean, that's why that's why we want you to be able to toggle back and forth and say, okay, here's my scope, here's my location-based total, it's right here. Here's my market-based total, it's right here. Second, to the best of my knowledge, um, for purposes of the carbon and climate commitments the number that um, will be tracked in the annual progress evaluations for second nature in terms of your progress toward carbon neutrality is always going to be the market based so yes it's important that you that individual campuses know both of those totals and if you're putting out um, reports or you know reporting on your website or whatever the idea um, is that the best practice is to say here's our scope to emissions using the market-based method here it is using the location-based method um, but then again ultimately you're sort of choosing which of those methods you're using to incorporate into your baseline and your current year in, ter in terms of being able to communicate your progress toward a goal um, so yes absolutely true that the um, that the guidance is to know and be transparent about both totals. Um, but for the purposes of reporting for, again, just for the climate and carbon commitments, I believe the intention is to focus on the market-based um, total in terms of moving toward carbon neutrality. Yeah, I just want to remind everybody that you have the ability to export your results. So if you want to see them side by side, you can export the market-based results in the spreadsheet and then the location-based results and then create a side-by-side -side comparison. Uh, to, to be clear, that's true for tier one subscribers. Correct. That's that, that export function. Yeah. yeah. That's what I was going for. Um, actually, it's not on that page. Okay. I think it looks like that's all the questions that have been submitted. Anything else on your end, Yulia? We're getting on to... I don't see anything, but I can uh, mute everybody if anybody has any last minute questions. Everybody's unmuted. <laughs> Make sure you don't say anything. We don't want to know. <laughs> well, it sounds like Folks are good. Um, obviously, if other questions come up or if there are resources or suggestions you have, like this, you know, like the, the request to have a report that has them side by side, um, if, if you have other ideas or requests, um, please let us know, be in touch. Um, we will have this recording available for uh, future reference on our resources page, and I believe. Um, Second Nature will have it to share with folks as well. Um, really appreciate you all taking the time today and really appreciate your leadership and investment in the issue. It's a privilege to have you as colleagues, truly. So thank you all very much and um, look forward to talking with you all soon. Have a great rest of your Monday. Thanks, Jen. Bye. Take care.